Well, thank you once again, Mr. Housen. Well, believe it or not, we are entering the season that's going to begin the fall holy days. Where did 2018 go? Already September 1st, the year is fleeting. In about a week, we'll be celebrating the Feast of Trumpets, the feast day pictures, perhaps more than any other day in human history. Two great contrasts, two contrasts of actual events. And these events are opposite of each other, and their outcomes are extreme at the same time. So it makes the Feast of Trumpets so incredibly unique. Let me give you an example. For those who are under God's grace, the blowing of the Feast of Trumpets will be the most wonderful, inspiring, transformative event ever witnessed by humanity as faithful individuals are literally regenerated from mere human to immortal members of the family of God. The excitement, the sheer joy of those who are involved when they hear that trumpet blast will be incredible, will be monumental. They'll be shouting for pure delight. In contrast to that, the same trumpet blast. Those who are not under God's grace. For those, it'll be the most tragic, terrifying, transformative event ever witnessed by humanity as it nearly has destroyed itself in world war. The world will go through terrible suffering because of its own sins, followed by punishment from God. The dread and the terror of those involved will be monumental. And this will include shouting, but shouting of despair and shouts of sheer terror. Both events occur at the same time, the same basic event. I oftentimes, and I kind of uh, strive within my ministry to be positive and talk about the good news of God's kingdom. And I try in most of my sermons and most of my messages to be very positive about God's way of life. But part of the commission that I have as a preacher is to also talk about some difficult things, some tragic things, some terrible things are going to befall this world. That, too, is my responsibility and my obligation as a pastor. So I'd like to talk about uh, some things today that are going to happen according to biblical prophecy and they're going to be tragic, and billions of people are going to lose their lives in a cascading number of events that are going to literally usher in the kingdom of God just before that kingdom is established. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. See something that Jesus Christ himself said here in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. Jesus said, talking about the end time, the latter days, for then there will be great tribulation, not just tribulation, not just a time of war, world war, and some of you are alive who lived through the second world war. You may have been small children. We have people here who have lived through and remember the Vietnam War. I remember the Vietnam War. I was born near the end of the Korean War. There are brethren here who remember the Iraq War, Iraq-Iran War, and Afghan invasion in Afghanistan, and all of these things that occurred. But Jesus said those are patty cake compared to something that's going to happen in the future. It will be a time of great tribulation. Such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. It will be the most terrible terrifying, tragic series of events that will ever befall this world. Verse 22, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Jesus is saying that he's not going to allow this world to destroy itself through nuclear war, through biological weapons, and you know why he's not going to allow that to happen? 
because of you, because you're God's elect. He has big plans for you. He had been working in your life for a long time. You are very precious, very special to him, and for your sake, he's not going to allow this world to literally destroy itself. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So there will be those who are false ministers and false prophets who will perform miracles. Maybe they'll even raise the dead. They'll do things in which the average person will say, wow, that's got to be of God because they're performing miracles. They're doing things that mere humans can't. They're doing things that are beyond human physics. Therefore, that must be the Christ or someone who represents Christ. It says, show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So this is a warning from Jesus Christ himself. The great tribulation is the result of man's hum inhumanity to man in the coming years and even though God's people will be given protection, and we don't need to fear the kind of events that I'm talking about today, we must understand that it is because of his precious people, that's you, the elect, whom God has called to be his future bride, that he will return in the nick of time, or this world would destroy itself from nuclear and biological warfare. There is a greatly entrenched system in the world that has to be destroyed before the kingdom of God can be established. Mr. Fader just scratched the surface today. It's deeper and more complex and more wicked than he had time to talk about and demonstrate today. And it has to be eliminated before the kingdom of God has an opportunity to be established and be successful. I'm often asked by people, Mr. Thomas, you know, what do you think about conspiracy theories? Well, I believe in one major conspiracy theory, and that is that this world is the, in the complete control of Satan the devil. Our educational systems, every culture that any human being has ever established in every religion is vile and evil. And in the control of Satan the devil. That's the conspiracy theory that I believe in and that I know of. It's a world system controlled by the devil. And this system must be overcome and eliminated before the kingdom of God has a chance to even be established or has a chance to be successful. It has to be removed from this earth. And today I'd like to examine the fall of a small city and we can read about it in the book of Joshua, and it seems like just uh, another one of the casual stories in the book of Joshua about the fall of a city, but it's much more than that because it's actually a prophecy about the destruction of this world system that exists in this world today. And there are a number of parallels between the fall of this city, known as Jericho, and the fall of this spiritual city that is stopping us from entering the promised land. So turn to Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. I'd like to examine the fall of the city of Jericho and show the prophetic parallels of the destruction of the city of Jericho and what God is planning to do with a powerful world system also presented in prophecy as a city that also has to be removed before the kingdom of God can be established. Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. They've crossed the Jordan River. There's something, there's a barrier between the people of Israel who had spent all those years in the wilderness waiting for this opportunity. There's something that stands in their way. That something is known as the city of Jericho. It has to be removed or oh, they can't go any further. They've been in the wilderness too long. It's their time. Brethren, we've been in the wilderness too long. It's our time. 
And Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth. And he's going to remove a world system that is stopping us, too, from reaching the spiritual promised land that God has promised. That is the kingdom of God on this earth. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. It was bolted tight. Nothing's going in. Nothing's going out. They are ready. It says, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've given Jericho into your hand its king. And the mighty men of valor, you shall march around the city. All you men of war, you shall go around the city once. You shall do six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets. I want you to remember that phrase, seven priests, seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, Joshua is about to take the Israelites into the promised land. This true historical event looked forward to and was symbolic of something far more than the Israelites going into the physical promised land. It looks forward to the children of God establishing and entering the kingdom of God, the true spiritual promised land. Jericho was impregnable. It was securely shut up. It was protected by a wall that made it impossible for it to be conquered. These were people who came out of the desert. They didn't have siege equipment. They didn't have any way to scale those walls. They didn't have any way to take down this city. Humanly speaking, there was no way the Israelites would be able to bring down this barrier, this city that stopped them from entering the promised land. It would indeed take divine providence, divine intervention for Jericho to fall. Many scholars believe that Jericho may be the oldest city on earth. Now, we wouldn't agree with the dates. Some scholars go back and say Jericho existed in 9000 BC as a city, and that obviously isn't a date that we would agree to. But let's just say that it's very, very old. It's certainly one of the oldest cities in the world. Many archaeologists recognize the city of Jericho as the earliest known walled city on earth which gives it a certain distinction. So this individual, Joshua, is told to take seven priests and bear seven trumpets and to prepare to take down this city. What about the name Joshua itself? Well, the name Joshua itself is Hebrew, Yehoshua, and it means Yahweh saves. It means God saves. And Joshua is simply an anglicized form of the Greek name of Yeshua. We, we call him Jesus because we've anglicized it into English, but originally in its shortened form, it means Joshua. So Jesus basically means Joshua, which is an interesting thought as we talk about this prophecy and the parallels that are going to occur between the fall of Jericho and the fall of Babylon. Okay, we're going to see some interesting parallels there. Let's go to Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2. And begin to look at this end time prophecy. We'll be going back and forth from Joshua 6. So if you want to save a space there with your piece of paper or a ribbon that you have in your Bible, that's wonderful, that's fine. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2 says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now these seven angels were prefigured by the seven priests in Joshua 6. Those priests in the book of Joshua represented these seven angels, and indeed they have seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar and was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, altar which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. 
Did you know that your prayers ascend before God? Every time you pray, thy kingdom come. Lord, this world is getting so wicked. There are so many problems on the earth. Please, I have a, a, a refrain that I use in many of my prayers. I say, please give humanity the greatest gift ever. That is the gift of your kingdom today. And every time we pray, thy kingdom come, all of our prayers go up to God as a sweet smelling incense. And he keeps them. He doesn't discard them. He doesn't neglect them. They're precious to him. He keeps them. It says here, in the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand, and the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Just like Joshua said, Seven priests with seven trumpets, be prepared. Be prepared to sound. Be prepared to do something remarkable. Here we find in the book of Revelation the same thing. Seven angels, take those seven trumpets and be prepared to sound. One of the powerful meanings of the blowing of trumpets was a call for battle. Trumpets were used in various ways in the Old Testament, sometimes to call the assembly together, sometimes to say it's time to march, it's time to move forward, or it's time to do certain things. But one of the most significant ways the trumpet was used was a call for battle. Just as trumpets were used to announce the fall of ancient Jericho, so too are trumpets representative of end time events when Jesus Christ will return to this earth to battle rebellious nations. There is one particular city that represents secular humanism, the secular humanism of this world and all that that means. It is synonymous with corruption. It is synonymous with degeneration. It is synonymous with false worship. Jeremiah prophesied about this very city that's also mentioned in the book of Revelation. Let's turn in Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 6 and see this prophecy because it is the same city the same prophecy that is borrowed in the book of Revelation, Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 6. Jeremiah was inspired to write, flee from the midst of Babylon. I think that's what Mr. Fader was trying to encourage us to do regarding our children and making sure that we just haven't bought into the lifestyles of the rich and famous, the celebrities. We've had a lot of celebrity worship this week. And it's important that we just don't buy into the lifestyles of this world, but we flee from the midst of Babylon because it's already here, because it's infiltrated our lives far more than we realize. Compromises have been made far more than we realize because it's insidious the way that it works. Flee from the midst of Babylon and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her or he'll, she's going to give her everything that she deserves. And it's not going to be pretty. He will, shall recompense her. Verse 7, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. That's every culture, every religious idea, every human philosophy, every educational system made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. That's what the prophet says. Other translations say the nations are crazy. The nations are mad. Jesus knew what he was saying when he said in Matthew 24, 22, we read earlier, but for the elect's sake, those days would be shortened. 
This world's on a suicide watch. It's going to be attempting to destroy itself. Thankfully, Jesus Christ won't allow that to happen. The ancient city of Babylon was responsible for taking the nation of Judah into captivity, but far more importantly is what Babylon represents. In biblical symbolism, spiritual Babylon is a system. It's a humanistic philosophy that rejects God and his values and his purposes. It's a secular human philosophy that promotes human values, false worship, perversion, deviancy, and the acceptance of all of those things. It is this spiritual Babylon controlled by Satan that Christ destroys when he comes to earth. Sadly, many of ancient Babylon's false religious practices still permeate parts of what's called Christianity today. So now let's go back to Joshua chapter six and verse five and take this another step further and see what happens and draw a parallel. Joshua chapter six and verse five. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. The interesting thing about shouting is shouting can, like this very day itself, represent two extremes. We can shout for joy. <laughs> yes! Oh, yeah! But on the other hand, we can also shout in utter terror. I remember a few years ago during the feast, I went zip lining in Costa Rica. <laughs> above the zip line was above the rainforest. So they pushed me off this platform, and I'm looking at the tops of trees. And I screamed blood-curdling screams of terror like I never had before in my life. I didn't decide it was fun until it was over. <laughs> but while it was going on, seriously, I never experienced that level of raw, sheer terror in my life hanging off that wire that's about as thick as my finger being held up by little staples that had been nailed to trees. They don't have OSHA in Costa Rica. <laughs> They're not so concerned with the saving of human life. But that's an interesting thing about shouting, of course, is that shouting can be positive, it can be through joy and excitement, or it can be through sheer terror. So Joshua is told that at a powerful trumpet blast, the people should shout. And this obviously was a shout of war because they wanted the city to be destroyed. God would then intervene and collapse the walls of the city and it would be utterly destroyed. Then without hesitation, when that happened, the people were to go in and they were to invade and conquer the city. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation chapter 17 and read about this great power that exists today that is a marriage and frankly has been a marriage for thousands of years between political dimensions and religious dimensions. It so happens that the woman mentioned here that 50% of all Christians worldwide are members of the church that this woman represents. It just so happens that 16% of the entire Earth's population are members of what this woman represents. So there's influence here, no doubt about it. Worldwide, tremendous influence. Revelation chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many Waters, As I said, this woman has influence and has members virtually in every nation on earth. 
It's 2,000 years old, and it has had tremendous influence and developed missionaries and missions around this world. Many waters, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, fornication is kind of a selfish thing. And the political leaders of the nations of this world said, well, I'll use you if you use me. I need your religious environment to be the glue that is unifying to my people. And this woman says, well, I need your protection as a secular power to make sure that I get my way that I can do the things that I want to do. So it's a mutual relationship between the political structure of this spiritual Babylon and the religious structure. It says, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They don't even know what's going on. They don't realize that they're being used, that they're being manipulated by a world system that is controlled by Satan the devil himself. Verse three, so he carried away so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Much like you would ride a horse, the rider is in control of the horse. This woman is in control of the beast. She is riding, she is sitting on this scarlet beast. The scarlet beast is a European religious power. So I saw a woman representing this powerful church religious philosophy sitting on a scarlet beast, this European political power, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads, and there were seven resurrections of the Roman Empire, and 10 horns, that last revival has 10 nations that come together, represented by these uh, 10 horns, 10 kings, who are nations who league together as the final political revival of the Roman Empire. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having her hand in her hand a golden cup. Incredible wealth. Phenomenal wealth. So much wealth that in the last 25 years you could have paid off thousands and thousands of victims of your priests who sexually abused them and you could pay these people off and you could pay big court judgments and you would still have a phenomenal amount of wealth. You would still have enough money to have influence in this world. Full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name that was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. Think about what's been in the news the last couple of weeks about the priests of this particular church and what they have been doing, not for decades, for thousands and thousands of years. It's only the last few decades that it's been brought to light, that it's been exposed, that many of them have been exposed for who and what they are, perverts and deviants. So when the scripture says here, abominations of the earth, it means exactly what it says. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And throughout history, particularly through the Middle Ages, when individuals would begin keeping the seventh day Sabbath, they were stamped out. They went into a local type of inquisition. When they began to try to keep the Passover rather than Easter, they were stamped out. John marveled with amazement at the power and majesty of this combined religious and political power. Even he was in awe of its strength and splendor. After all, it's millennia old. It's been going on a long time. It's powerful, influential in ways that most people don't even comprehend and understand. It seemed as if it was unstoppable, unconquerable. So much wealth, power, and splendor, influence. Seems like nothing could take it down. Well, let's go back to Joshua and the story of Jericho. Joshua chapter 6, 
And we'll pick it up here in verse 10, Joshua chapter 6, verse 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came to the camp and lodged in the camp, and Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. God states here, that there is a specific chosen time when the people were to shout, not before. And it was this very shout that would cause the city to fall. Not necessarily the trumpet itself. The trumpet would lead to the shouting. The shouting would cause the city to fall. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God in this miraculous event and his divine intervention. Now dropping down here to verse 15. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, they marched around the city seven times, and the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot, shall live and all who were with her in the house because she hid messengers that we sent. God reserves the right to have mercy on whomever he decides to have mercy. Again, immediately after the trumpet blast, it is the shouting that brings on the destruction. Verse 20, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat and the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. So the priest, escorted by the Ark of the Covenant, blew the trumpets and signaled the people to shout and it was a loud noise representing in, uh, like a sonic boom, and perhaps it was accompanied by winds or earthquakes. The loud shout was representative of the voice of God. Now back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. We just read about all the shouting, the loud noise in the book of Joshua. Let's see what the book of Revelation tells us. Chapter 14 and verse 6. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying in a loud voice, we call that a shout where I come from, Fear God and give him glory, give glory to him, for the hour of judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So just like the fall of Jericho, just like it was necessary for it to happen, for Israel to enter the promised land, the fall of spiritual Babylon makes it possible for the kingdom of God to be established on earth. So what happened to the other cities soon afterward? What happened to the other cities in Canaan? Let's go back to Joshua chapter 10 and verse 5. Joshua chapter 10 and verse 5. It says, therefore, and this is Joshua chapter 10, a few chapters back from where we have been. Chapter 10, beginning in verse 5. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jermuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up 
And they and all their armies encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And by this time, Gibeon had made an alliance with Israel for protection. Verse 6, and the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp saying, do not forsake your servants. Come to us quickly. Save us and help us. For the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. Verse 7, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Haran, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Mechada. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Haran that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. So after Jericho fell, other cities, like dominoes, fell one after another as Israel took over the promised land. So after Babylon falls in the future, what happens next? Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out from the temple of heaven. Where have we heard about these loud voices, the shouting before? From the throne saying, it is done. I'm pulling the trigger. As we say in 21st century terminology, their toast. It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as mighty a great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. That's the city of Babylon was destroyed. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great Hail. Where did we read about that previously? Great hail fell from heaven upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. I want you to notice the parallel. Just as hail was used to destroy the five kings of the Amorites, so too it is used as a tool to beat down the cities of the nations of this world. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Go back a few chapters, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. It says here in chapter 11, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices. Where did we read about that previously? Loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God in their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, 
and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. God says, it's time, it's done. And it's time for me to give the reward to my elect, to my servants, the saints, who endured to the end, who remained faithful, who worshiped me on my holy days, who loved my Sabbath day and my law, it's time for them to receive their reward. Continuing here, we remember, of course, that during the fall of Jericho, that the Ark of the Covenant was present. That was just the physical representation of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. Verse 19, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of his covenant, and that's a parallel to what we read in Joshua chapter six, was seen in his temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings and earthquakes and great hail just like we read in Joshua chapter 10. Well, I have some really good news for you today. This sermon's going to end early and soon. There's just one final trumpet associated with a shout that I would like to read today, that I would like to mention. And it's contrary to all that we've been reading to. We've been reading, some, to, we've been reading about some very horrific events, again, that are going to unfortunately cost billions of people on this earth their lives through some events in prophecy known as the Great Tribulation followed by the Day of the Lord. But for those who are under God's grace, the same events and the same trumpet blast that signals what we've been reading about today signals something totally different for you and for me. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15, if you'll turn there with me. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15. We've spoken about the horror and the destruction and death now let's talk about joy and eternal life. First Thessalonians chapter four and verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, meaning those who have died in the faith over the last 2000 years of faithfulness to God and who died and are sleeping and waiting for a resurrection. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him or with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. If you want to know, since you're going to always be with the Lord, where you go next, take a look at Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4 and see that his feet land on the Mount of Olives. And as it says here, we will always be with the Lord in Jerusalem, the capital city of the kingdom of God, where from there, the culture, the new education and right culture and right religious values from there, like a grain of mustard seed, will eventually encompass the entire earth. As I mentioned in the beginning today, for those under God's grace, it will be the most wonderful, inspiring, transformative event ever witnessed by humanity as faithful individuals are literally regenerated from being merely human into immortal members of the family of God. The excitement, the sheer joy of those involved will be deafening. It will be a shout of raw joy. Let's do our part to hear and witness a shout of incredible joy. Let's do our part to remain faithful. 
do our part to stay close to God through prayer and study and worshiping on his Sabbath day and fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters in Christ and using the power of God's Holy Spirit to make those necessary changes within ourselves so that we can please our Father and so that we can be used by him as servants for all eternity. And it begins on that day, the Feast of Trumpets. Have a wonderful Sabbath day.